Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Titled this message today, From Pit to Praise. We're gonna praise a little bit more at the end today, just so you know. And uh, I think we've all been in moments where we have been in pits of despair, anxiety, fear, struggles. Uh, pits can be struggles with, with sin, struggles with fear. Um, it could be opposition of things. It could be a trial in your life. They come in all shapes and sizes, even the pit of grief. And we've seen a lot of that in the past few years and, and people are still wrestling with grief as well. And that takes time. But I wanna, I wanna encourage you today. Pits are not permanent. Why don't you say that with me? Pits are not permanent. I've been stuck in pits of despair. I've been stuck in different kind of situations, but I'm here. And you're here. And we made it through. Just a quick reminder. Praise the Lord. God's got me out of a lot of things, and I'll probably have to do it again. Thank the Lord he is faithful to do that. I felt prompted to bring this word to you today. It's something I've been meditating on all summer. I uh, even meditated on it while I was in Alaska on our vacation, just reading through the Psalms, and this Psalm stuck out once again. We're gonna be in Psalm 40, one through five. Psalm 40, one through five, if you have your Bibles. I use the NLT version, and some, some people have been asking me because they've been wanting to purchase that, so the NLT version, New Living Translation. Uh, one of the strengths of the New Living Translation is it's a Bible for new believers. So if you're helping new believers um, and helping them grow, it's a great Bible to purchase. It helps the, uh, interpret the language for you in modern day times uh, without losing its um, sacredness and what it means in the scripture. Psalm 40, one through five, I'm gonna read it, I'm gonna give you some context and then teach it and then give us some application. Sound good? Very good. Psalm 40, verse one. This is David. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. Oh, Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal if I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. Amen. The psalmist is David, and we're not exactly sure what kind of pit he is in. Uh, we don't have the exact story for this psalm. Other psalms, you could connect the dots that something happening in his kingship or some kind of decision he made. This one is a little more vague. But Psalm 37 through 39 and 40, so it's 37 through 40, um, scholars have connected because he's using, using similar language of waiting. And in, in Psalm 37, he talks about waiting. Psalm 38, Psalm 39, and now he's talking about waiting in Psalm 40. They believe that he cried out to God saying, I'm gonna wait, and then the answer comes in Psalm 40. Now there may be some different perspectives on that as well. but. That is what I see in the scripture too. Now, we do see that in Psalm 37 through 39, he's struggling with enemies because he's a king. And kings leading Israel, they had enemies. But he's also struggling because of sin in his life. And he's not afraid to admit that he has sinned. And he even acknowledges that God is disciplining him because of his sin. So we see this, uh, at least two situations here where he's dealing with conflict with people, 
probably because of his kingship, how he's a king and a leader. He's also dealing with the, the choices, the consequences of his choices. But we all know there's another reason why this can happen, and that's because evil is in the world. So there's three reasons why someone might be in a pit. One, their own choice. Two, they may feel like they're in a pit because of their sin and God's disciplining them, but God disciplines those he loves. So God doesn't intend for you to stay there. Okay, he's just humbling us and teaching us to call out to him. You know why God disciplines us? So that we'll turn and repent and come back to him and be humbled and rely on him. And the third reason why you could be in a hard time is because people are evil sometimes and, and the devil's at work in our world. So these three reasons is the possibility for why David feels like he's in a pit of despair in the mire, the muck, and the clay, and he's in the mud and he needs help getting out. And so that's the context there. What did David do while he was in the pit is so important. We see here that he cried out to the Lord. He prayed for the Lord to rescue him. Sometimes your prayer is more like a cry than it is just a prayer. If you've been through some things, you're crying out to the Lord. It must have been tough because David says, I cried out to the Lord. He was saying, save me. But we also see that David cried out to the Lord, and he actually says that in the second line, not the first line. But the first line says, he waited patiently for the Lord. David waited for him to act. For, for God to act, for God to respond, and God ultimately does. What did God do? God delivered. God rescued. God saved David. And here's what the scriptures show us. It says here that God turned towards David. He heard David, and he acted by lifting him out of this. this uh, and by the way, this wasn't a physical pit. This is a metaphor or um, figurative for the trial he's going through. He lifts him out of that and then he sets him on a solid rock or steady ground. You know what's beautiful about this? David doesn't just see that he's been lifted out. God actually sets his feet on solid ground and steadies his walk. That's beautiful if you think about it. God made sure that David could walk again, that David could continue forward as a king or as a man of God. And the results are powerful. We see in this, in this text that David goes from being in despair to singing a new song that God has put in his heart. By the way, what Pastor Arya said in the beginning of this service before we started worshiping was theologically sound and solid. She said that it's the joy of the Lord, not the joy of the, of the world or the circumstances. God gives you joy. That kind of joy is joyful in all circumstances. Well, God also gives you a new song. Now, some of you may, I'm not a singer. <laughs> I'm not a musician. I'm not an artist. It's okay. It might, it might not sound like one of the worship team members up here, but God can put a new song in your mouth. And my friends, sing it out loud. All right? Just warn anyone around you in case you don't know. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. He goes from despair to singing and praising the Lord to all who would listen. And this deliverance stirred up that new song in his heart. And then David wants God's, this, is, this part I love. David wants God's deliverance to be proclaimed and help others trust in the Lord. Let me, let me read that for you just one more time. because This is what stuck out to me so much too. Uh, he says, many will see what he has done and be amazed. Many will see what God has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. David wants his, his pit to turn into praise that helps other people trust the Lord. How beautiful is that? And then verse four says, oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud, or in those who worship idols. So in other words, no confidence in man or yourself, but your confidence is in the Lord. Your trust is in the Lord. Those who trust in the Lord have joy. Have you ever noticed that you just have joy even though things are going bad around you? It's probably because you just trust the Lord to take care of it. 
My kids and I, we were going through this last night. We were doing devotions yesterday together. And I said, the reason why mom and dad have peace in all circumstances is because we know God has everything under control. He's in charge. Because of that, I can have joy. Doesn't mean I don't have my days where I feel grief or despair or I'm struggling with worry or fear. But that does not make up my life. Joy is the mark of my life. If I'm not smiling, I could be just tired. Could be going through something, maybe. But the reality is I'm smiling more than I'm not because of the joy of the Lord. I trust the Lord to take care of everything that's going on. How many of you know, too, that you can just have this joy without even thinking about it because you trust the Lord? How many of us have just got up and lived life and you, didn't, you just knew the Lord was going to take care of you? You didn't worry about anything. Praise God for that. Praise God. That's a place we want to get. And he says, the joys of those who trust the Lord. And lastly, David gives us a sample of his song and his heart. Verse five, O Lord my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. One version says rival. You have no rival. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. My family tried that last night and it was was just gonna go too long. It was just gonna go too long. Isn't it true though? God has done so much and there's things that you don't know that God has done. When you weren't looking or you just couldn't see it because he was doing it behind your back for you helping you. How do we apply this to our lives? What some takeaways we could have? Really simple message here, simple scripture, um, and some simple takeaways. Number one, the Lord is worth the wait. This is what David said in Psalm 37 previously, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. So this is the hint about him dealing with some enemies is he's saying here in in light of that, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for God to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. This trusting and waiting has to be one of the hardest things to do, isn't it? To trust God to work and help you as you wait, it seriously grows your faith. It will grow your faith. When we wait on the Lord to act, we get God results instead of just good results. I don't know about you, but I want God's results in situations. I don't want what I can work out. I want what God can work out. It's worth the wait to wait for the Lord to do his work. Amen? As you're in your pit of despair, and I don't know what you're going through. Maybe you're out of the pit right now. But when we're in it, what can we do? We can wait because it's worth the wait. What God can do is so much better than what we can do. Now, this is an excuse to do nothing, but what, we're, what I believe David is trying to get across is he wants God's work, his results, and I know from experience that if I try to do things, I mess it all up. It's better right now for me to just cry out to the Lord and wait for him to get me out of this struggle, to show me the way out. But it's not an excuse to do nothing, so what can we do while we're waiting? Number one, we can pray in the waiting. We can pray. And every day, pray. Every moment you need to pray. If it comes up, if you're worried, if you're struggling, pray. We need to be humble and teachable in the waiting. David was humble. In the previous three chapters, he was humble and teachable. He told God that he was wrong. He, he asked God to help him. He knew that he needed God's help. And so he was calling upon him. Thirdly, we should live with integrity in the waiting. I'm not sure if you're in a pit or the mire and the clay because of a choice you made or because of evil or um, because of other things or people, other situations and circumstances. It it may be nothing is that, that serious. 
But as we wait for the Lord, we should wait with integrity and make right choices. Amen? And then lastly, you know what you can do too? Because you know that the pit isn't permanent, you can start praising God while you're waiting. Believing that it's coming. That what you're going through, the trial that you're going through is not permanent. He's going to get you out of it. I like, I like to praise the Lord in my trials because it turns my attention on what's going to happen and not what is happening. While we wait, number two, here's what we can know. While we wait, God is moving and working to rescue you. Even when you don't see it, God is working. Even when you don't feel it, church, God is working. Praise the Lord. You know what God does in scripture? God responds to the cries of the humble and the righteous. He responds to the cries of the humble and the righteous. So while we're waiting, that integrity is key. While we're waiting, being humble is key and praying and living a righteous life because God responds to those cries. You know, when Jonah, when Jonah rebelled, which was wrong, he cried out to the Lord for help and God showed grace and mercy because he cried out to him. God showed grace and mercy uh, in the midst of him making a terrible decision to disobey God. Jonah was tasked to go to Nineveh and he said, I'm not doing that, I'm going to Tarshish. And God gets his attention with a large fish and while he's in the belly of this large fish, which is possible if you've seen the news. <laughs> okay. Like an entire kayak went into a whale's mouth, all right? All right, just saying. Jonah 2.2 says, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. The land of the dead is in the belly of the fish down in the depths of the sea. Poetically, he said, that's the land of the dead. And God had rescued him and Jonah had realized that and thanked him. And so we know later on Jonah is spit out on land and goes and does what he's supposed to do. He was humbled. Second Chronicles 7.14, we all know the scripture. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, number one, pray and seek my face, number two, and turn from their wicked ways, three, notice the integrity, the humility, the prayer, then, then I will hear from heaven. God turns to us and he hears us and forgives our sin and then heals our land or our situation. He pulls us out, praise the Lord. It's almost like God's wanting us to want to be saved. In other words, sometimes we have to see we are in a pit of despair or we are going through something. We are in a trial and we, want, we need to want to be saved. We need to be, want to be rescued. Our, our world's in that situation. Our world doesn't see they need saving, right? But we do. So let's pray. You know what we can do? Let's intercede for our world. If they're not going to pray to God, let's pray for them. But let's also pray for us because he's talking to the church here at this time, the people of God. Let's turn from our wicked ways. Let's humble ourselves. Let's cry out to God. James 4.10, this is what happens when we do. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So God lifts us up. This is all connecting to David's psalm. Psalm 37, 39 through 40, he ends that, that chapter saying this, the Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them, and they find shelter in him. Praise the Lord. Ryan, I feel like God's not there. The grieving's too great. The struggle is too strong. My despair, it's just too much. There's no way God is hearing me. There's no way God's going to help. Well, that's, that's not true. You know what Psalm 139, 7 through 10 says? Where can I go from your spirit? 
Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Praise the Lord. Call out to him. Call out to the Lord if you're in some type of pit. We can call out to him, humble ourselves, and he will be there. He will rescue us. You know, every time in scripture where people did that, God showed up and pulled them out. By the way, you can't get out of some of these things. I couldn't get out of my sinful state without the grace of Jesus Christ. The greatest pit that you and I will ever be in or was in was our need for salvation, was being stuck in our sin. We needed to be saved. Only Jesus can get us out of that situation. There are situations you're in that you're trying to do it on your own power and ability. You're not gonna get out of it without the help of the Lord. He's saying, look to me, cry out to me, I'll get you out. Thirdly, here's how we can apply this scripture. When you get out, get the word out. In other words, praise God. When you get out of that trial, don't forget to praise God. Amen? I'm being serious too. Let me tell you why. Sometimes we're in the pit so long, we forget how to praise God. Or sometimes we've been in the pit so long that we don't even see all the good that God's done because all we see is the trial we've been in. And meanwhile, David says, there's so many good things that God's done, I can't even list all of them. There's that many. And so sometimes we can get so used to being in the situation that we're in that we have to learn how to praise God and see all the good that God has done in our lives again. At least that's been my life. And give God the glory he is due. Your trial, your pit of despair, your rescue is meant to help other people go through theirs. David said that his, that his delivery would help other people put their trust in the Lord. In other words, God doesn't waste your trial. God doesn't waste your struggle. When you're delivered, he uses that to help other people. We should get the word out. Church, there's so many people going through so many things. We, we, we're nonstop here as pastors. We're nonstop. I, I'm from the pastor to the congregation, we need your help. You have a testimony. You have the, the ability to help people just as much as we do. Pastor Cornelius is in the room. He's our care pastor. This guy is so busy, he can't see straight. We're so busy trying to help people through difficult things. Pastor Jody has have to schedule people out a month in advance, two months in advance, just to get one appointment. There's so many people going through so much stuff. There are people around you struggling and suffering, and you have a beautiful testimony of how God has pulled you out and put you back on the ground, steadied and thriving again. Let God use you. Let God use your story. Let God use your trial. It is not wasted. Spend some time with someone. Encourage the people around you. Let them know what God has brought you through. Amen? Amen. Lastly, we can take hope that God restores. God restores. When you go through these things, you tend to lose some things. And I'll be completely honest with you, you don't always get back everything exactly the way it was. And sometimes you get back even better, okay? Psalm 90, 15 through 17 says this, give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. I read this on vacation too, this was funny. I needed it though. Replace the evil years with good. 
Let me read that again. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us, your servants, see you work again. Who wants to see God work again? Let our children see your glory. And may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. What about Psalm 126, one through six? I'm just gonna read it for you. When the Lord brought us back, his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy because they had been banished and now they're being brought back. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the, renew the desert. Those who plant in tears now, those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. You may have shed tears and have wept, but out of that, God can turn it into a harvest of joy and turn your com- complete circumstance and restore your circumstance. I thought about this. God redeems our misery and turns it into a ministry. He does. I don't know, church. I don't know how people do this life without God, do you? I couldn't do it. I don't know how people do this without the help of the people of God and the prayers of God's people. If I didn't have godly people in my life to pray for me, to come alongside me, it would be hard. And that's what I'm saying earlier, that your, your story, your deliverance is meant to help people around you, to encourage you. And by the way, let me uh, make sure you understand something. Earlier when I said, like, we're so busy we can't see straight, that doesn't mean we're not available, all right? We make ourselves available because you matter to us as pastors. What I'm saying is, it's going to take all of us to help people get through what they're going through. It's going to take us pointing people to Jesus, too, because ultimately he is the only one that can get them out of their despair and their pit. We don't realize how much we can handle until we go through some of these things, huh? It's true, right? But more importantly, we don't realize how faithful and powerful God is until we go through them. I'm here to say I've seen God's faithfulness and power because I've been through things. Knowing the Lord knows your circumstances and how to get you through is comforting. Going through hard times changes us too. I hope it's not so much cynical, but more grateful for the Lord and helpful for those around us. So where are you today? Are you in a pit? God would say, the word of God says, cry out. Ask him for help. Pray to him. If you're in the pit, he says, wait patiently. Let me, let me work. Just be still in my presence. Let me work. Trust me. The hardest thing to do is to trust God. He's going to work it all out. If you're not in a pit, we can help other people get out. And we can be praising the Lord. If you're in a pit today, I want to encourage you with something. Let me stand because we're going to praise God. We're going to worship him. I want to encourage you with something. If you're in a pit right now, I'm going to say some really simple words to you that I need to hear too when I was going through things. The sky isn't falling. It feels like it, it seems like it, but it's not. Okay, that's up to God. Your life isn't over. How many times have you heard that? My life's over. No, it's not. You'll get through this. It's true. 
you'll get through this. This too shall pass. How many can testify? <laughs> Cry out to the Lord. Or today, maybe we just need to praise him while we're in the pit and praise him outside of the pit. So I want you to do something for me. Don't start yet, team. Just, just hang on. Okay? Think of one thing the Lord has done for you and hold on to it. Just take a moment. If you have to, close your eyes. Just meditate on the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. That list is so long. It shouldn't take us too long. Okay? No matter if you're in the pit or outside the pit, just think of one thing that God has done. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. This is, this is going to be different. You ready? Don't be weird about it. Don't say anything too personal. But just start, just someone say a few things. Like, tell me in the audience, just say one thing that you're, you thank God for. You walked in here without your wheelchair. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Wow. That's amazing. He's taking care of your family, yes. He's faithful to our families. Praise the Lord for that. What else? Come on. Yeah. Wow. God saved your husband when he had a 3% chance of survival. That's praiseworthy, right? Amen. Come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God restored your marriage. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come on now. Praise God. I, hey, we're sliding over here. Go ahead. Okay, uh, seven years ago, I had a 99.9% chance of going home to him. Wow. Wow. That's right. Stephen almost passed away, but God saved his life. Praise the Lord. All right, we, got, we, we just went over here. Come on. Amen. You get to wake up every day and have the opportunity to make a difference in someone's life. Go ahead, sister. Wow. Restore your family. Ten year breach. Wow. Praise God. Man, God is good, isn't he? God is good. Let's just begin to praise him. Lord, we thank you. God, we praise you, Lord. We've been going through some things but you're going through them with us, Lord. Lord, we cry out to you to rescue us, Lord. We sing your praises today, God. Even when we don't feel it, no matter what situation we're going through, God, we're gonna praise you. Lord, we take uh, time to recognize what you've done for us. There's so many testimonies in this room. Lord, I pray we would fix our thoughts on you, Lord. Fix our eyes on you, God. I pray, Lord, that we can turn from the pit to the praise because you have pulled us out. Lord, that we won't do it on our own and that we'll call out to you. We'll wait patiently for you to act, to do it your way, Lord, and that we will praise you and help other people praise you as well. We will help other people go through what they're going through. God, we dedicate this song to you, to worship you and to thank you and to reflect on all the things you have done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.